Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth AGI AGF webinar. I'm Hei Wai Tang, the Associate Director of the Asia Global Institute and the Acting Director of the Asia Global Fellows Program. The AGI AGF webinar provides an intellectual exchange platform for Asia Global Fellows from all around the world to interact with the leadership of the Asia Global Institute and the Institute's network of experts on important global policy issues. The Asia Global Fellows Program, directed and administered by the Asia Global Institute at Hong Kong U, is a global leadership development initiative for mid-career professionals with strong interests and track records in public policy. Since its inception in 2017, we already had four cohorts, a total of over 50 up and rising stars in the public policy sphere joining the program. Each year, the Asia Global Fellows will come to Hong Kong stay on the Hong Kong U campus for 13 weeks, inter interacting with industry practitioners, policymakers, academics, and experts in general here in Hong Kong, as well as select countries in the Asia Pacific region. We aim to build a lifelong network among the fellows and engage them in interactions with global thinkers and thought leaders via the AGI's network. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the the last cohort, the fourth cohort, could not come. But today, we are very happy to have three Asia Global Fellows from three different cohorts joining us to talk about a pressing issue about the post-Trump uh, global environment. Now, let me pass the microphone to Al Ries, the Director of Knowledge Dissemination of AGI, to introduce the panelists. Thank you very much, um, Hei Wai, uh, and welcome to you all, to Hong Kong, to the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong, and to this webinar on leadership in a post-truth world. The assault on truth in societies is really not a new story. It's as old as creation and the beginnings of faith, the determination of good and evil. The challenge of recent years has been the proliferation of ideas of mass deception. In an environment of rapid fire communications, rushed news cycles and pervasive social media, all turbocharged by increased inequality, the rise of identity politics, money politics, the grievance, political correctness and cancel cultures, intense tribalism, and indeed the rise of populist nationalist movements, in many societies, to varying degrees, we have seen breakdowns in civility and community, impediments to reform and change, and the collapse of trust. The deadly invasion of the US Capitol by rioting insurrectionists was really only the latest example of the dire consequences of this crisis of confidence. Our leaders in government, business, and civil society um, need to rebuild that trust. But trust is, in some ways, not the only issue. The insurrectionists in Washington, D.C., after all, they trusted the President of the United States, so much so that many clearly thought they could attack the Capitol with impunity. So this is not a problem in the East or the West, in developing or developed, in rich or poor countries, in free or not free societies. In authoritarian regimes, of course, people have to deal with propaganda, with official lines, with an overt and not so overt repression of the truth, whether through censorship or other means. The situation is trickier, possibly, in more open political systems that have the trappings of democracy, such as the balance of power in government, checks and balances, a vigorous press, or even constitutional structures that are meant to provide safeguards. Citizens who desire good governance, who want results from their leaders, may find it difficult and be dispiriting and even deadly when elected leaders themselves are the ones pushing untruths or enabling those who tell them. There is a supply and demand problem. More and more false information swirls around supplied by those with disingenuous, dishonest, or mischievous intents, or even for innocent ends, for innocent reasons. But also there's a swelling demand among people whose worldviews are driven 
not necessarily by facts and figures, but by emotions, how they feel. So consider the atmosphere in the US post 9-11 and how perceptions about Iraq, Saddam Hussein, the political rhetoric and allegations of the time and poor intelligence presented as fact was led that all of that led to US military action and to the US entry into a quagmire from which it has yet to extricate itself. The problems really are many and the challenges can be a matter of life and death. Just take the pandemic and the different approaches to how to address it. The politicization of mask wearing and the debates over the wisdom of lockdowns. And of course, the safety of vaccines, which is a, a key challenge for all countries today. You know, one survey here in Hong Kong found that 40% of young people are averse to taking the vaccines for whatever reason. So what are leaders to do? How do governments make policy in this kind of environment? How do business leaders navigate this world? How can citizens cope, especially when the boundaries between truth and fiction are so blurred? So we have uh, to tackle the many aspects of this topic, a wonderfully diverse panel uh, today. Interestingly, they come from places where parliaments, uh, I, this is an interesting point, where parliaments have been stormed in the last two years. So uh, that's an, uh, an interesting uh, commonality between uh, among the three of them. So let me introduce them alphabetically. First, we have uh, Mark Levitt, who is from the United States, but is resident in Taiwan. He's a 2017 Asia Global Fellow, and he's visiting assistant professor at National Chengchi University and the co-founder and partner of Zeitgeist Strategies. He has advised a number of candidates and groups on messaging and organizational strategy. He played key roles in presidential campaigns for President Barack Obama and as a senior staff member to Senator Bernie Sanders. He also worked as a policy advisor at the US Department of Energy during the first Obama administration. And in between his campaign work, he received a law degree from Georgetown University and practiced for several years as a defense and investigations attorney. He holds bachelor's degree, a bachelor's degree in philosophy and German, stu and German studies from Brown University. From Georgia, we have Nona Mamulashvili. She is a 2020-2021 Tanoto Asia Global Fellow. She is a member of parliament and was elected last year uh, from the party list of the United National Movement. Now, Nona is chairwoman of the Caucasus Eco Economic Policy Institute, a think tank that promotes structural change and institutional development through policy research and advocacy in the Caucasus and Central Asia. She was until yesterday also a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute. She previously worked as regional director for Pfizer, covering Caucasus and Central Asian countries. She also has public sector experience and was the senior advisor to the analytical group of the president of Georgia and later a political analyst at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She has a business administration degree from International Black Sea University in Georgia, where she is an associate professor and a master's degree in diplomatic studies from the University of Westminster in the UK and a doctorate in international relations from the Sorbonne in France. And finally, Jason Yip, who's a 2020-2021 Tanoto Asia Global Fellow. He is Chief Executive Officer of MWYO, a think and do tank on youth policy in Hong Kong. He was uh, formerly a investment bank financial analyst, but changed his career to work on humanitarian issues, particularly in developing economies. Before returning to Hong Kong in 2019, Jason was the regional head of the unit at um, the Government Affairs and Donor Relations Division of the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, covering China, Malaysia, and Singapore. And he's also worked in Geneva to develop dialogue and mobilize resources with member states to the Geneva Convention to develop um, And he was previously stationed in Palestine, Afghanistan, and Myanmar as an ICRC delegate to implement the relevant humanitarian intervention in those places. 
He also contributed to various emergency relief initiatives such as the Sichuan earthquake in 2008 and the Rohingya crisis in 2015. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Hong Kong and a master's degree in international relations from Waseda University uh, in Japan. In 2018, Jason was awarded a Medal of Honor by the Hong Kong SCR government. So welcome to the three of you. It's wonderful to see you, our Asia Global Fellows. Now, let me turn first to Mark, if I might, uh, because, of course, the invasion of the U.S. Capitol is very much on our minds still, um, some weeks since the event. Um, so when it comes to um, uh, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, the insurrection is, illustrates the sort of extreme consequences of many people believing falsehoods spread by leaders, instigators of com conspiracy theories such as QAnon and, and their supporters. Um, so, so Mark, tell us about how you viewed the insurrection and its aftermath and what all that has happened, what that says about truth decay, as Rand Corporation calls it, and its impact in the United States. Uh, it's my pleasure, and, and it's also my pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to Nona and Jason, and Jiwu, Al Yu, and Heiwei, uh, and Joyce, and Yvonne, and all those who have set this up for AGI. I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and chat with you. Um, the capital insurrection was probably was only the second time in my life when I had to wake someone up so that they could see what was on the news. The other one was 9-11. So that I think speaks, you know, sort of at a, at a gut level to my reaction to this event, which is that it's, you know, it, it was emotional, visceral, and, and powerful from the outset. Um, what I would say about what it says for truth decay and the capacity for societies to handle uh, mass conspiracy thinking and the, the lack of trust. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a sort of macro answer uh, first, and then we can maybe look at micro. And I, I really appreciated your mention of sort of the history behind conspiracy theories and, and low social trust and those sorts of things, because uh, I think that one of the sources of what happened at the Capitol is indeed very old in the United States and has been written about at length. You can go back to Richard Hofstadter and his paranoid style uh, in American politics. And, you know, you go back to McCarthy, who chronically lied in order to gin up political sympathy for his attacks on communism uh, at the State Department and other agencies. So, it, you know, it's not new. What I think is new to this capital insurrection scenario uh, are the, is the confluence of a variety of economic cataclysms. You have the financial crisis from 2008. Uh, and the Obama administration's uh, policy shortcomings in addressing it. You have the pandemic, uh, and you have concentrated economic dislocation in a variety of ways, in a variety of places uh, where Trump supporters happen to be concentrated. And so uh, you, you have all of that happening at the same time as social media has generated a sort of this perfect machine for taking people who might be sort of peripheral to uh, conspiracy movements or peripheral, peripherally uh, vulnerable to adopting lies as truth, uh, and uh, and and they've just been sort of ginned up, and you've got sort of you know social media taking vulnerable people, you know, well tilled soil for this kind of thinking and this loss of trust, uh, and and built it up to a degree that is that is really sort of unprecedented, at least in the United States. And what I would say is that this confluence of circumstances uh, really sort of reflects a breakdown in the social compact for a lot of these people. They've come to believe that the institutions and the, the governments and the news gatherers that are supposed to be representing them and supposed to be representing their interests are simply failing at their jobs. And when that's the case, uh, truth just doesn't even play a role in it. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't really care about truth if truth hasn't done anything for them. And so, you know, the lies themselves become attractive and fun and, uh, and you see what happened uh, at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, um, Mark, uh, t tell us a little bit more, though, about um, this legitimacy deficit, if you will. Um, how uh, I mean, you have basically in, in the United States, in some ways, the gold standard of democracy. So uh, you have people 
um, voting for their leaders, they get elected, and yet uh, there are people who, who, who um, a large uh, uh, segment of the population who are unconvinced that their leaders are doing what they're supposed to do, and yet they get elected over and over again. They get returned to Congress. So, so uh, does that, what, does that, what does that actually say about the quality of the democracy in the United States? Uh, I mean, it's in a parlous state, I would say. Uh, you know, I worked for a guy you mentioned before, Bernie Sanders, whose sort of core conceit was that uh, the system was rigged. And so there are people on both the left and the right be that believe this. Uh, the right wing happens to have sort of weaponized and, and, uh, and, and turned it into sort of a, a violent movement, uh, whereas the left hasn't uh, done so to quite the same degree. But the, the left is out there on the street, street doing so too. Um, uh, what I would say is that you're talking about a very large question, you know, the oligarchic control of the US government, uh, the failure over a period of years to restore trust in government. I mean, one of the first things that Barack Obama tried to do as he got into office was lift up the numbers of people who believed that government could be a positive force for in the world. And he left office without having done so. Uh, so it's a, it's a deeply intractable problem. Uh, I don't think you've got sort of a near term solution for it as long as there's this elite capture of the United States Congress uh, and you know legislatures all over the country. And so uh, I, I do think that you know, you've got a, a, a series of factors that do suggest incredible weakness uh, in the US government. And this, this legitimacy crisis uh, is at the core of the truth decay because the sources of truth for so many Americans just aren't to be trusted. Uh, and, you know, that that includes, you know, Joe Biden, that includes Donald Trump. Uh, there's, you know, there's somebody on the political spectrum who doesn't trust, uh, you know, all the various people who are trying to talk to them and convince them of what's right. Now, the pandemic has really added, I mean, a, a tremendous stress to, to that system that's failing, right? And, and, and the results have been truly disastrous. I, I, I'm wondering whether, you know, the, the fact that things can be so dire and yet there is this rejection of fact uh, in large portions of uh, the American population. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm thankful to be somewhat insulated uh, here in Taiwan, but I, I do uh, obviously keep in touch with my friends back home, um, you know, I've mentioned in a, an email as we were getting ready for this, uh, for this webinar that the United States really has broken into two countries. They're basically the people who, you know, sort of believe in science and you know, public policy to combat it and those who don't. Um, and uh, that happens to break down along partisan lines in part because of Trump in part because of social media and all, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, there, there's no question about it that the, that the cleavage is only, you know, getting wider uh, as you have um, people who are fighting the vaccination process and, you know, not wearing masks and these sorts of things that are just sort of, you know, basic public health measures that for, you know, a century, the United States had, you know, taken for granted as reasonable ways to, to combat disease. Um, yeah, I would say that the pandemic, both for economic reasons um, and, and for reasons um, that dovetailed with Donald Trump's um, re-election strategy, frankly. I mean, Donald Trump's re-election strategy was to pretend that there was nothing going on so that he could get people to his rallies and gin people up. And that was, was a very conscious decision on their part. Um, it's, it's making the situation worse. And, and you know, and um, I'm sure we'll get to a point when we can all talk about our thoughts about how to make it better, but um, it, it's, a, it's a deep hole to climb out of. Thank you. Now, uh, let's turn to Jason. Um, tell us then, Jason, uh, about the situation in Hong Kong, because I would imagine many of the themes that um, Mark brought up uh, resonate in Hong Kong, almost like um, you know the two countries he's saying uh, in the United States. Uh, I mean, we talk in Hong Kong about you know yellow and blue and oh, yeah, you know, what exactly. have you, and then of course the issue of the legitimacy vacuum. So so uh, so we went from the protest movement in 2019 and then a pandemic last year. So many of these issues have certainly percolated. Um, and the, uh, so uh, w w what are your thoughts on, uh, on, on all of this? So thank you so much. And in fact, I want to start with the, ins because everyone compared the, the invasions to the capital a few weeks ago with what happened in Hong Kong in 2019. 
when there was a similar invasion to the Legislative Council. Uh, I talked to a bunch of a, a, a few medias or the protester at that moment, how they view the difference. Of course, uh, they would say it's completely fundamentally different. The, the two incidents cannot be compared uh, like uh, all together because uh, the one in the United States recently is, uh, is actually uh, based on the fake news or un ungranted uh, information to 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 claim or allegedly claim the election was not uh, was was not trustworthy or whatever, but uh, the the invasions happened in Hong Kong was completely a reaction from the public to, uh, to the very controversial bill pushed forward by the government. So the it didn't generate a very very sensitive uh, debate uh, after the invasion to the capital happened in uh, in United States in Hong Kong, but uh, the people try to distinguish uh, very clearly. They cannot compare the two incidents together. But uh, when Mark talk about United States now inferior to countries, actually, I would say in Hong Kong we can name locally here. We are in three universe. I cannot name countries here. We have the blue, a bit of pro government or pro China. We have the yellow a little bit uh, pro the public or the protest uh, most of the time. And we have the Hong Kong local government themselves. Why I try to isolate the Hong Kong government themselves is exactly what Mark and you have talked about the legitimacy uh, deficit or victim that I, I would name it. Because this is uh, directly linked to how the Hong Kong government was uh, created or actually selected. Because uh, not even everyone in the pro Beijing uh, establishment uh, can have a say about uh, who, who, who can be the, the, the chief executive of the, of, the, of the Hong Kong government and how they choose the people. So basically, when compared to other society in the, in, in, in the Western world, let's say, um, the government kind of are selected by a rather big majority of the people. But uh, the Hong Kong government have no way to mobilize or does not have the legitimacy to represent uh, most of the people in, in, in the society, not even uh, the post-Beijing camp. They, sometimes they talk, uh, I mean, with alignment with each other. But whenever it comes to con con controversy and things to criticize, you see bro both the blue camp and the yellow camp will criticize the, the Hong Kong government altogether. So if I compare the Hong Kong government with Donald Trump, uh, the, the administration, I would say President Trump still have the power to mobilize people by whatever rumors or fake news or all the information that he can push forward. But what we have observed in Hong Kong is throughout the protest, the social movement, uh, until the pandemic, not until recently. Uh, the Hong Kong government, no matter how hard they have tried to push forward information, whether they are good or sometimes are not good information, uh, they cannot mobilize the public reactions that they want. I, I think this is all linked to the, the, uh, the legitimacy vacuum or deficits that we have been talking about. But at the same time, you see from the public perspective, the features of the post-truth society is all there. People spinning on information or so rumor that are not to be confirmed. And uh, they, they, they write on incidents uh, to, to criticize the government may not have done certain investigation properly, or uh, the government have some wrongdoing, but based on uh, allegedly not very confirmed information. But you can see because of the lack of legitimacy somehow, the Hong Kong government are a bit uh, passive or they have no way to fight back or push back all this argument. So that's why you have the society quite divided right now in Hong Kong that I would say it. Thank you. Now, um, the trust deficit in Hong Kong though, uh, talk a bit more about the, how it, um, how it happens, in, uh, what are the dynamics of that within the context of the Hong Kong mainland relationship? Sure. I mean, uh, firstly, I cannot, uh, I mean, in order to be uh, balanced or neutral to most of the party in the city, I cannot uh, associate the, the, the discussion of lack of trust or the, uh, those kinds of things uh, to correlate uh, the social movement to the Hong Kong government because uh, to most of the protesters, they see a very fundamental reason why they went on the street. But at the same time, of course, uh, of that, uh, you can see uh, the lack of trust is always there. I think, firstly, similar to, to what uh, Mark have mentioned, uh, 
for the last couple of years or even a decade, there's a lot of things are happening uh, macroly that uh, make the, the fellow Hong Kong and here to believe the local government in Hong Kong here not really working for their interest. Uh, after the financial crisis in 2008, you see the, the inequality, economically speaking, between the rich and the poor are, are not really reconciling with each other. And at the same time, uh, you see the, the education system are always under controversial uh, uh, discussions from no matter you call it the national education or the national identity and all these kinds of topics, then that adds on. Uh, the sentiments of the Hong Kong people that they don't trust the, the Hong Kong local government. At the same time, they were wondering what is the agenda with the Beijing government. I think somehow, because the Hong Kong government is always in the legitimacy deficit with the public, even though they try hard to build the relations between Beijing and the Hong Kong local citizens here, but it's actually counterproductive most of the time. Now, what about the pandemic? Uh, tell us a bit the Hong Kong experience with that. And, yep. and why do we see such a large proportion of young people say they would not like to take the vaccine? They have a very fundamental correlations, uh, I would say continuations of the momentum from the social protest. The trust is not there. So no matter uh, what the government have been saying, that the youth kind of uh, without it, no matter what. But of course, at the same time, I have to, I have to, I have to say that uh, at the fair beginning of the of the of the pandemic, uh, the Hong Kong government, uh, the chief executive and key officials, they were not consistent in their public speech. Sometimes similar to what happened with the WHO, they say no need to put on masks. Even a government official would put on masks he or she will ask the government official to remove it immediately. I think these kinds of things, it, it doesn't it even need to uh, evaluate whether a public policy is good or not, whether the government performance is good or not. Just, but just by the public speech of the officials themselves is already contradictory. I think when this day with social media, people can slap shot a, a key statement and start spinning across the social me media universe is actually are hurting the credibility of the government themselves. But, but I would say when, when it's getting to the second half to 2020, you start seeing the, the Hong Kong government working a little bit better. I think they, they learned the lessons uh, from, the, from the social movement and also the first half of the pandemic. They start streamlining their, their way of communications. They're making public announcements every day at the same time, same format, and try to be open to the media as much as they can. And I think compared to the political issue, health and medical issue is a bit more serious or, or more personal to, to most of the people. So uh, the Hong Kong government start getting back their trust or credibility from the public. I hope they can keep on doing a bit better until the end of the pandemic. So it's interesting. So we, we see the lack of trust, the divisions in a society, and the crucial, um, the importance of better communication, sort of clarity of communications from leaders. So uh, let, thank you very much. Let's turn to Nona. Um, Nona, uh, tell us about the situation in Georgia. And I remind people, this is not the US state of Georgia, but the country <laughs> of Georgia, where you are on the front lines of the battle against uh, truth decay as a member of parliament newly elected. Uh, and one might argue that Georgia has long been immersed in a world of untruth. Uh, so tell us a bit about your situation. Yes, uh, well, uh, a little bit about the current environment. Yes, I have been elected and my party has been elected uh, by the people uh, as the MPs of the parliament. But however, because of the falsifications, the immense falsifications that happened during the elections, we have uh, uh, rejected to enter the parliament. So we are only technically the members of the parliament because we will not be participating in this uh, theater of absurd that uh, the ruling party has uh, has is, is staging now so this is a boycott uh, just just to clarify this is your, a boycott, is a boycott. Yes. we are we are boycotting and we are we are requesting the snap elections because uh the votes have been stolen and uh by the respect of the elect electors uh, and the electorate in georgia uh we requested the georgian uh dream which is the ruling party now um calls for the snap elections in order to have uh the fair and transparent elections in you now um what is happening in georgia regarding the truth decay well uh you know georgia has been for for the seven decades, pretty much the 
the part of the Soviet empire. Uh, and uh, the post-truce, unfortunately, has never happened because we are still living, uh, we're still expecting the truce period to happen because uh, as the part of the Soviet propaganda um, machine, uh, the population in Georgia was the victim of the Soviet uh, Soviet brainwashing, uh, especially during the Cold War period. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the influence of the Russian Federation uh, on the Soviet on the post-Soviet countries has gradually weakened. But um, uh, especially after the color revolutions, as we call them, the peaceful revolutions that happened in some of the post-Soviet countries and the Rose Revolution, particularly in Georgia, uh, Russia's uh, near abroad policies uh, uh, started started to change uh, as we started to move closer to the EU and uh, and and the NATO structures. So um, uh, the EU's and NATO's foreign policy is promoting is promoting the democracy, which um, Russia perceives as the geopolitical as as a threat to geopolitical interests, especially in this region. So in order to strengthen its position, Kremlin is uh, uh, is engaged in the hybrid war. And uh, to today, no one argues that actually the, um, the Russian propaganda is the is the global challenge, and Kremlin has weaponized its um, the information. So apart from the political and economic tools, uh, Kremlin has become uh, very active in using the in using the modern technologies, and uh, it, it's spreading the propaganda through the various channels. And they're very creative with. Uh, uh, with finding the, the, the network of the distributors. And uh, the, the, the recent ones I can cite as the example are the politicians, not only the local ones, but the international politicians. For instance, there is the, the Senator Cox uh, of the Dutch parliament, which is the populist politician in Europe. And he's been used literally as the, as the, as the um, mouthpiece of the Russian propaganda. So where is the truth decaying here? Uh, in Georgia, people, the population still believe because he is European, he cannot be uh, the, the, he cannot be the, 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 the tool of the Russian propaganda. But unfortunately, we are seeing more and more the populist politicians in Europe being used by the Russian propaganda in order to spray the disinformation. Now, there are other things that the, 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 the traditional uh, Soviet and now Russian uh, institutions are using uh, in order to uh, spread the disinformation. And those are the, uh, through the research institutions, through journalists, through NGOs, the businesses. Uh, well, social groups, but uh, regardless of the country, so they 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 do especially uh, more um, target the countries uh, and they study the country's weaknesses. Uh, and uh, the target of the of the Russian propaganda in Georgia is the polarization of the population, and the objective actually is to um, uh, is to discredit the liberal values and democratic process. So, um, in order to undermine the national cohesion and the institutional resilience, so this is how. Uh, the Russian propaganda works. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and I, um, I was listening to Mark, who said that the oligarchic control of the Russian government, of the US government is part of the problem. Well, this is another tool that the Russian propaganda is using. And we have seen that uh, in many countries, um, Russia has installed the oligarchs uh, as the heads of state, and they have done so in Georgia. So the Russian, uh, the, the, the oligarch of the Georgian origin who became oligarch in Russia has been installed in 2003, uh, in, in 2012 in Georgia, I'm sorry. Uh, and since then, for the last eight years, we're seeing the, uh, the, uh, the immense um, strengthening of the Russian positions in Georgia and the Russian propaganda, who is actually playing on the national sentiments of the population and, 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 and trying to demonstrate that the West is not a choice and we have to go back to under the Russian influence. Thank you. Now, uh, and I'm wondering if you could address uh, the issues that are faced, especially by fragile democracies in transition. That I mean, you've spoken uh, to that to some extent. Where, where you know, in the context of the constant and sort of systematic repression of hello? truth, but you have a, a a a budding democracy, and what are the challenges there in terms of um, these the, the post truth uh, challenge? Uh, in in uh, in young democracies, the uh, the most important uh, process is the building the democratic institutions. What we have seen in the U.S. Uh, is uh, whatever happened could in any other whatever happened in the U.S. in any other country could have turned into a civil war or even worse. Uh, the the institution, the strong democratic institutions, are uh, the the fundamental. 
um, value of the of the U.S. democracy. This is what we're trying to build in a, in in our part of the world. Unfortunately, uh, because Russia doesn't have the friends in the establishments, Russia will support, is supporting, and will support the entire establishment. It, it is supporting the groups that would undermine uh, the value of such an institutions and uh, and will discredit uh, the, the the values of the liberal democracies. So this is where the government intervention is critical because um, this propaganda, the Russian propaganda, uh, is the national threat uh, and has to be addressed as such. So as long as the government is playing the part, is playing the puppet in the, in the, in the show, we will not be able to stop this process, we will not be able to counter this propaganda. Now we have seen in the, in the, in the European Union, in the US, they already realized the, uh, the influence and the uh, and the magnitude of the of the influence of the of the of the Russian propaganda within their countries, even in the democratic countries, and um, they are building the institutions to stop uh, or counter this uh, the, the, the spread of fake news and propaganda. However, the the young democracies as Georgia, we still have the process to go. But here, there is the political will of the government to be the participant, either to par be participant of this process or to introduce the measures to stop it and, uh, and, and start building the genuine democracy. Thank you. Now, I'm going to do a, a second round with our panelists, but I encourage um, our audience to please submit questions. We already have some. Um, on the, the second round, I'm wondering if I could ask you guys to talk a bit about, well, what do leaders such as yourselves, what you can do uh, in this post-truth world? Uh, how do you rebuild that trust? How do you build that legitimacy? Um, how do you deal with a divided country such as the United States? So, so um, you know, and, and, and you might want to also possibly talk about the challenge of the, of social, that social media poses in these situations. So, so Mark, uh, your thoughts in the United States, uh, you know, what, 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 what should Biden do uh, confronted with this post-truth uh, uh, world in which uh, uh, he has enormous uh, issues, challenges uh, right now? Uh, drop money from a helicopter, I think is probably <laughs> uh, his best bet. I mean, that, that you know, does a couple of things. I mean, I think on a sort of a base level, uh, it helps resolve some of the economic uh, you know, problems that families are facing right now. But also more broadly, you know, the issue is that, or one of the key issues, I should say, not the issue, too complex, but one of the key issues is that people have simply lost faith in government. And there's no better way, at least in the Biden administration's hypothesis, to prove that the government could do something positive than trying to rescue, rescue them from the economic doldrums that arose from the pandemic. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the COVID aid bill that's you know, moving through Congress now or is about to move through Congress uh, is a good first step. Um, you know, I, I despair of what else they could do though, uh, because beyond that, uh, you get into questions of people's physical location. You know, so Trump supporters are largely in rural areas. Uh, Biden supporters are largely in cities and getting them to even interact is an extraordinarily difficult challenge. Uh, one that has arisen in the course of the last several decades of of, uh, of American political life. And so uh, I, I don't exactly know what the policy solution is behind, beside, you know, trying to rescue the economy. Um, you know, as to the question of social media, I, you know, I think, you know, cutting out Section 230 of the um, Telecommunications Act would be, and I'm not sure if I got the name of that uh, law correct, but Section 230, cutting out Section 230 would help. Uh, in that right now, for those who aren't familiar, Section 230 just says that social media platforms are not responsible for what gets said by people on them. And so if there's an incitement of violence that takes place on Facebook, Facebook is not responsible for it. You eliminate that liability protection and all of a sudden Facebook and Twitter and all the others <coughs> are suddenly far more incentivized to police the kind of things that go on to their networks. And so Facebook and Twitter and you know, TikTok, they all now have reason to think that the spread of conspiracy theories, and particularly QAnon, is you know potentially responsible for an outbreak of violence, right? And so, in a precautionary way, they would presumably police their platforms a great deal more than they are currently doing. There are all kinds of implications for free speech uh, that that um, that are are touched upon here. Uh, but I would say that um, the Section 230 uh, exemption is unique to the tele uh, telecoms platforms. 
um, and that you know eliminating it wouldn't necessarily uh, you know impose any further restriction on free speech that, for instance, newspapers don't have. Um, so uh, all of this is to say I don't know what the policy solution is because the problem is so large. Uh, but I'm I'm excited to hear other people's thoughts uh, and. Uh, Back to you, I guess. You almost, uh, I, I think in one email exchange that we had, you said possibly the only solution is some kind of social collapse. Yeah, that was my pessimistic take, which is that, you know, you, you, you take such a, a large group of people who aren't going away, uh, who are, you know, willing to storm the Capitol. And, you know, obviously that was, you know, the whole of the United States wasn't storming the U.S. Capitol. It's, it's difficult to tell what the exact scale and scope of this problem is. Uh, but I don't think they're going away. You know, something like half of the Republican Party was perfectly willing to believe that the election was stolen. And when you have that kind of, uh, you know, to use the German term, Dolchstolz, you know, the backstabbing um, uh, uh, big lie, you know, about, you know, how uh, their, their political power was taken away from them, uh, that's, that's a problem of indefinite magnitude. And I don't know what, where, what happens. I don't know where, when it goes away, right? Okay, now Jason, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of how leaders can cope or uh, you know, how young people uh, can cope in this kind of environment? Yeah, uh, before I, I share my view, I, I want to uh, say I actually understand why market is a little bit uh, pessimistic about the, the situations because uh, by doing a proper policy to gain trust to restore the society, it may take years especially when we have the social media engine right now can, can spread information much faster than a social or public policy can be put in place. It's actually a, a big challenge uh, for, for any government to, to gain their trust or especially if they have lost it already. It's, it's no easy task. Uh, but uh, I, at the same time, I, I, try to, I try to ask myself, is that uh, the single issue or is a very specific phenomenon only happening in the US or Hong Kong or Georgia? I, I would say most of the government leaders these days are, are seeing a very polarized uh, world because of the social media. Uh, but at the same time, we see some good public figures or leaders, they have quite some legitimacy or trust from the public. Let's take Germany as an example or Singapore as an example. They are also facing the challenge from, from the social media, but, but the government leaders in, in those countries are, are actually uh, responding quite well to, to the pandemic, at the same time handling quite well all the, all the criticism controversy happening in, in, in their countries. So I would say firstly, it's going back to the, the, the personal uh, perceptions of the government leaders today. They are elite, whether they can actually stay in their, their room and thinking the, the outside world is static. They can use all the experience and knowledge that they have learned or accumulated over the years and run the society today. I think it's not possible. They have to actually step out from their establishment, step out from their boardroom and get close to the people. Because of the social media and the flow of information, no matter it's rumor or confirmed information, it's just so fast today. The needs of the people are changing like in a second. So if government is not responding correctly or, or precisely to the situation, they have a lot of misjudgment. I think that the trust issue somehow is the accumulation of all the misjudgment by different government officials over time that happened to the, to the situations today. This is the first thing. And the second thing is, I don't think we, we should rely only on the government leaders to, to solve the situations because uh, today where most of the parties or sectors in our society are so autonomous, everyone have certain autonomy over the small universe they are handling themselves. I think the civil society or all other stakeholders have a, have, a, have, a, have a role to play. I would say in Hong Kong uh, recently, even okay, because the, most of the protester community, they are the, they are the biggest user of the social media. Even the government accused they are the one uh, spreading the, the fake news or misinformation around. But you can also see the, 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 the a bit uh, proactive uh, protest uh, community also seeing the problem of fake news or unconfirmed information in their community. So this day we, uh, we, we see them start discussing whether they can actually start a kind of like an education program to the youth at school or whatever before anyone responding to any survey or anyone making any judgment or decision, they have to have the habit of comparing 
uh, sources to, to, to try to, no one can understand the so-called truth, but they have to get close to the truth. I, I think right now in the social media, everyone have the, have the thinking like with internet, we should have the capacity or capability to know what's going on truly in the, in the whole world. But actually because of the massive amounts of information, we are actually further away from the truth because there are too many garbage, uh, um, I would say, uh, mixed together. So we need to be even more critical compared to our previous generations in terms of information screening. And there's a last point I really want to touch upon. Um, Mark touched on it a little bit, but I think it's a very sensitive issue here in this part of the world is how we, do we need to regulate or so-called control information in social media or internet, especially for this part of the world where it is famous, uh, there are lots of censorships or lots of information control from countries to country. So why now, whenever we, we see the issue in social media, we see a lot of fake information is there, but whenever you want to touch on it, try to regulate it, the public will, will bang back very uh, rapidly and saying that it's the control of freedom of speech. I think. I think it's difficult to, to draw a balance here. That's my point of view. Great, thank you very much. Now, uh, before I go to uh, the audience questions, Nona, uh, your sense of the solutions from your perspective. Uh, sorry, I, yeah, you have to sorry. unmute him. Yes, yes, I, 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 I am unmuted, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, well, you know, unfortunately, what we have seen recently, and as I've mentioned, coming from the Soviet past, you know, the, the lack of trust in the government was already there, especially in the post-Soviet space. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the governments themselves these days have become the source or the creator of the fake news. And uh, this has deepened even farther the nihilism in the population. Uh, so uh, now we have seen that the, the social media now has uh, actually uh, amplified the problem because there were different sources during the Soviet period how the propaganda was spread. Now the social media and the new technologies has amplified it and, and have given the, um, some of the, uh, the, the, the governments in the post-Soviet space to further strengthen and the, the, the propaganda. So the first solution is that the governments themselves have to withdraw from the spreading the fake news. Uh, and this is not only in, in Georgia, but in the, in, 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 the, in the neighborhood and a bit larger globally. So um, at the same time, they, it has to be recognized that the fake news is, uh, uh, is a threat, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the national security. The transparency of the, fi of the, of the financial um, uh, sources has uh, it has to be one of the uh, solution to the problem as well because there are many um, institutions non-governmental uh, organizations that are uh, being um, uh, financed by the uh, the, the questionable sources and uh, the standards of the transparency are not there. So this is the, this is another part of the might be the part of the solution. And uh, there should be a very targeted programs um, the locally and internationally to help the uh, media and the civil society uh, to uh, be more active uh, in uh, countering the fake news. In, for instance, in Georgia, we have um, we have a platform called uh, the the, the mis detector and every time we see the, uh, the the fake news online that is spread uh, by the, um, the, the the questionable sources the mis detector immediately verifies the source and provides the alternative information so there are the things like this that could be done and uh, and the government themselves are the key uh, solution to uh, bringing back the trust of the population no no would you uh, do you support uh, Twitter and the other social media platforms um, uh, canceling Donald Trump's accounts? Uh, well, no, uh, because this is, uh, and, and coming from the, from, from the Soviet past, the censorship was something that- Sorry, we, we're a little bit challenged. Uh, that, oh, there we go, uh, your, your audience. Two side, um, yeah. but, uh, in the the, the uh, uh, social, uh, how, how, well, it was something a new the new phrase that has been formed. Uh, the e, uh, what was it? Uh, the, the 
the censorship, the electronic censorship is setting the precedent uh, and could be very dangerous in the future. Yeah. Mark, did, would you? So, did, did, uh, no, I didn't support it. And yeah. what, what, Mark, what was your view on, on, on Twitter uh, canceling Donald Trump, as it were? I mean, I was basically fine with it. I mean, in, in US free speech law, there are very few thresholds for what you can't say. And one of them is incitement to violence, right? And the, the threat, the imminent threat of, uh, of unlawful action uh, arising from one's speech. And the, the case was colorable that Trump was doing that. Um, at, you know, whether or not uh, Twitter should be the arbiter is I think, you know, a question I'm not necessarily in place to answer, but they are. Uh, and I was, you know, basically okay with Twitter shutting down somebody who was, you know, potentially going to cross like, you know, the one threshold U.S. free speech law has. <laughs> you know, yes. everything else is basically fair game. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was pretty okay with that. But, you know, prior to that, I, you know, I would have seen no reason to do it. Now, uh, we have a question from Alice Mong, who's um, executive director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Uh, for Mark, the uh, question is, it, it, it's one thing when people on the streets believe in conspiracy, conspiracy theories and lies, but how do you deal with a Georgia uh, representative, uh, con a congresswoman, uh, and, and her kind of loony lies and conspiracy theories? Who, who's actually a member of Congress? How do you we're deal talking, with that? Yeah, we're talking about Marjorie Taylor. Yes, Marjorie Green. Taylor Green. Yes. Yeah. How do you deal with it? Well, you know, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, the guys who wrote "How Democracies Die" were very good about, which is that uh, they recognize the role that the, the 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 institution that is the political party to which she belongs has to play in this scenario. And really, there's not a whole lot that we as, Demo as I as liberal as Democrat um, can really even do about it. I mean, she was elected by a whole bunch of Republicans in a district that has the right to do so. Uh, but what I think needs to happen and the Democrats should, you know, create the space for <clears throat> is for the Republican Party to reject what she's doing and, and smack down her conspiracy theories and lies. That's sort of the essential step that has to happen here. Now that's not necessarily, it hasn't happened for the last four years with Trump. So no expectation that there's going to be some broad rejection of Marjorie Taylor Greene. But you know, there are, there are sort of hints of good steps that have been happening with Mitch McConnell yesterday uh, calling her, uh, her, I think he used the term cancer. I don't know if he applied it to her or if he applied it to her way of thinking. Uh, but that's sort of the essential step that needs to take place uh, you know, in order, to sort, of, in order to, to sort of keep order uh, over the institution that is the Republican party. It's on them. Now, uh, we have a question from Sebastian Contin, who's um, from Spain and one of the 2020-2021 Asia Global Fellows. So he says, thanks to Jason and Nona for updating firsthand about the situations in Hong Kong and Georgia and the state of democracy, the rule of law and institutions under the post-truth era pressures. So let's hope for the best. And he asks, according to your own feelings, do you believe that along that in 2021, the situations in both places will improve or what, what is your outlook for Hong Kong, for Jason and for uh, Georgia going forward for Nona? Jason first. Um, okay, so I, I, I make the discussion a little bit more controversial. I think the, the situation of Hong Kong will be stable at the moment because uh, no matter whether people like it or not the, with the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong as actually filling the, the legitimacy vacuum of the Hong Kong government. It's given weight over there, uh, the public, um, whether they agree or they're happy or they don't agree, they're not happy, the law is there. So it's given the, the central weight of, of all the discussions uh, that, uh, that uh, people have to trust or believe the government will take action the government have the order and things like that. I would say, yes, Hong Kong is stable. Uh, you have the very clear gravity of, uh, of authority right now in Hong Kong. So if the Hong Kong government grabs it well, uh, they can rebuild their, um, their channels at the single most important channels of information in this city. But uh, it doesn't mean they, they can then do whatever they want. They still need to, uh, from the policy perspective, responding to the needs of the people. They cannot ignore the economic problems, the education left behind or all the disturbance in the education system. Uh, if they don't do it uh, well, I would say the stable period may last for four to five years. And then uh, 
once all the factors uh, put together, another crisis may happen. So I hope uh, they can get the chance of this uh, stability and we build a little bit of trust between them and the, and the people. Thank you. Nona, your thoughts on the outlook uh, in Georgia? Yes. Well, first of all, I was looking for a word uh, there recently. So it was e-impeachment that I came across uh, <laughs> the, uh, coming to the censorship of, 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 tra of Trump on, uh, on, on Twitter. Now, um, uh, the outlook. In the middle, what, um, we have seen what happened in, 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 in D.C. recently, but in the middle of the crisis, we have seen that the Senator Shaheen um, cited the example of Georgia's 2012 elections as the best um, example of the importance of the, of the peaceful transfer of power. I mean, for, the, for, for us, for Georgians, for a small country of Georgia, it was a very inspiring uh, to be cited as the, as the, as the uh, example and the importance. So um, I, uh, as the outlook, I do not expect any violence to be developing in Georgia because uh, uh, our position is the peaceful um, uh, transfer of power based on the transparent uh, on the transparent and fair elections. So, uh, however, we do we do see the. Um, uh, the threat coming from the impact of the Russian propaganda in the country. And this is the one that we will be uh, addressing through the legal means that exist already in Georgia. Thank you. I'm just going to alert our control room that I probably go a few minutes over and I hope that's okay with our panelists. I have um, a question here from Amit Kumar Bali. As we are observing during these current days, the polarization of society everywhere, everywhere, divisive politics, mass media and social media differences, uh, instability. And um, uh, how do you think we can come out of the problems confronting the world? In, in, in the sense that the, I, I guess what he's talking about is the geopolitical instabilities that are driven in some ways by, by this post-truth environment. Um, Nona, would you have any thoughts on that? I mean, because you're you're in a world that's that, that it has become so volatile as a result of competing truths, if you will, between countries. Uh, well, you know, we are seeing the 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 the, the cycle of of the decay, and uh, I think. Um, the revival process will be painful, but it has to, it has to come uh, because the lack of trust, uh, it's not only in the governments, but it's in the social orders and uh, the population, uh, what, I've, what I'm feeling in Georgia and in, the, in most countries that I'm visiting is the nihilism is uh, uh, one of the feelings that has been spread uh, during this period because people lost trust. Uh, in in institutions, people lost trust in the in the in the in the in the future, and um, we are we are seeing the period of the depression as well. Is it a political depression or moral or moral decadence? Uh, it is the it is the matter of the uh, of time to understand and of the of the in depth analysis. But I do see that there is. Uh, as in every cycle, there was a decay, but there will be the up upheaval. And uh, I do expect that, you know, for many governments, it was a wake-up call, especially especially this uh, COVID and post-COVID period will be a wake-up call in order to bring back the trust uh, and install back the trust in, in, in the populations of, of their respective countries. So, uh, thank you. Mark, uh, what about the the issue of truth and untruth in a geopolitical relationship such as US and China, uh, uh, between it, China and Taiwan. I mean, you're in Taiwan, the mainland in Taiwan, right? Yeah, and, and Taiwan has to deal with a profound disinformation challenge, yes. uh, as you can probably guess, right, from, from mainland China. Um, uh, I, I think there's this sort of interesting dichotomy between autocratically propagated disinformation and sort of grassroots propagated disinformation. Um, I don't know which one is easier to solve, right? I mean, in theory, with an autocrat, you would have to like topple a government, but you know, with a with grassroots propagated disinformation, you'd have to what topple a people. I mean, these things seem to be both sort of you know um, uh, immovable objects meeting unstoppable force kind of thing. Uh, so I don't know what the resolution is there, and, and I do think, for instance, that um, you know the the uh, the the sort of global competition between regimes that uh, um, uh, I think adhere slightly to the truth and regimes that you know sort of don't that sort of just cast it aside 
uh, is is going to be you know fundamental to the coming years. I mean the the you know I see this on the internet all the time. I mean to the extent that I participate in it, but you know there's there's uh, a battle going on right now for understanding what countries are even doing. You know so whether or not you know South China Sea is being populated for the purposes of military expansion is a question that you know China has tried to cast doubt on, even though it seems to be self evident. Right. And so the United States is in the position where, you know, they have to sort of uh, illuminate the, that situation and, and make it more clear for people. Um, and and, you know, it's very possible that, you know, you sort of have a, a breakdown between two spheres, the truth based world and the untruth based world. Um, and I don't know where uh, the United States is going to land in that, given our recent history. Uh, but but it's possible that that will be a cleavage, uh, you know, for, for purposes of, of global conflagration. And one country may not be just in one camp or the other. Act it could yeah. be different issues be in both in both camps, right? Yeah. Um, now um, I have a question uh, that I think uh, Jason would be best equipped to answer, coming from Nima, and I believe this is Nima, one of our fellows as well, uh, looking into the future. What's the role of education for children in building trust? How should we prepare our children in the post world, a truth world of net neutrality and free speech? <laughs> education is actually very controversial in Hong Kong these days because uh, we are still um, in a very sensitive relations with the Beijing government, how to define the education curriculum in Hong Kong that's in line with the with the theme of one country. But uh, definitely, I think uh, education have a role to play. I think one of the, uh, in fact, I came across a program recently um, in, in Hong Kong that there's a startup in education technology trying to push forward. They are trying to create a platform to create a, a competitions or tournament between schools. It's, uh, it's about uh, how youth can, can compare sources and then uh, to express their will to, to vote for the options that, uh, let's say a debate, you can, you can select the option, you vote for it. They, they want to launch it in a couple of schools to test it in the next six months. Uh, they call it cow voting. It's like the cow funding, but everyone try to compare information and things. I think in, in, the, in, the, in the world today, we don't have a single source of information. We can say they are true or they are absolutely correct and whatever. It's about the habits or capacity of the new generation, whether they can compare uh, between sources and they, are, they can critically reveal themselves um, and, and always evaluate themselves. I think what, what is the problem with the social media is people take things too easily and believe in it immediately. I think that's also related to the way how human being thinking most of the time. Uh, we have to break that habit from that perspective. Thank you. Nona, I'm just wondering if you could close uh, this uh, session by, by just uh, giving us your thoughts on education and any sort of takeaways that you um, have from our discussion. Well, uh, we we're, we have seen globally that the, the fake news have become uh, uh, the serious problems, uh, the serious problem. Now, how to tackle them and how to how to rebuild the trust in the population that is uh, uh, descending into the nihilism is is a question. So it cannot be answered very easily. Well, education could be a solution, but it is a long-term solution. Can anything be done immediately? I think uh, the, um, the civilized world has to work closely in order to help each other and, uh, and, and prevent the malign powers from uh, spreading or um, uh, uh, aggravating the already existing situation so that we are seeing already in the uh, in the European Union and uh, probably in the US I haven't followed that the institutions have are, are, are built in order to prevent the spread of the fake news and in order to uh, prevent the dissemination of the fake news because it has become the problem for for every single country uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the cooperation with the technology institutions uh, where with the big tech companies could be another solution because they have to work hand in hand the governments and technical and, and te uh, technology uh, and tech companies in order to find the solution to this. Well, yes, this is a problem. Uh, how to stop it? I think there should be uh, the very serious consideration in the post-COVID period, uh, given the sensitivities that we have seen, especially now, uh, and the danger of the fake news uh, for the for the populations globally. Thank you. 
Um, so thank you, all three of our panelists. Um, when I was in college, I used to uh, study in this building um, that had a, a engraving at the pediment that said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set ye free. <laughs> And I always thought, well, you know, there's something quite noble about trying to say, well, there is one truth. But uh, we now live in a, in a world where, you know, alternative facts, maybe some truth is another person's lie. Uh, and we, it, it's a confusing world and a world that's uh, more volatile, where communications are uh, um, a rapid fire. Uh, what is a person to do? And I, I, I think you, you all have um, talked about many different aspects of this. I think a key issue is, well, how do you heal divisions in society? Another issue is how do you communicate um, uh, challenges and problems and in a way that then encourages bringing, bringing uh, creating or shaping solutions based on fact and not on fiction. I think policymakers have to start thinking about how you integrate the policy development function with the communications function. So you can better um, consult with a wide range of, uh, of, of stakeholders to create policies that are actually based on evidence. They, we talk about evidence-based policymaking, which seems a bit you know, repetitive because policy should be evidence-based, but um, uh, sometimes nowadays they're not. They may be politics-based solutions, but if we have more policies that are based on fact, not fiction, not, not politics, then we may actually address uh, the key problems that are uh, driving a lot of the divisions that are creating this, um, uh, in some ways, the more destructive uh, situation that we have, as was seen on January 6 in Washington, D.C. So thank you very much to you, Mark, to you, Jason, to you, Nona. Uh, thank you very much to our audience for tuning in. Sorry, mm -hmm. just a slight, uh, a few minutes over the time, but we appreciate your joining us here on this AGI, AGF webinar. Thank you and follow us on social media. Asia Global Institute at Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. And thank you very much.